Awesome. Hi, everyone. Welcome, near folks near and far on YouTube. Um, we are really excited. This is the first week of our summer series on participatory planning. Um, super excited to launch this conversation, these conversations with y'all. Um, as you guys have seen, we have a full list, a full, um, um, I guess, calendar, I guess, summer calendar of uh, folks coming through to share uh, their insight, knowledge, um, work along, around um, participatory planning. Um, and so hopefully y'all can come every week. Um, these conversations will build on each other. They won't be repetitive. Um, they'll be dynamic, um, skill-based and capacity-based. Um, and so I um, really hope y'all can come through um, and just share in conversation with us. Uh, we're gonna continue, as you guys know, participatory planning is a key um, sort of tenet of our work. Um, understanding how to do it and like incorporating it into parts of our work is like what we're constantly, um, Oh, incorporating into how we like develop our community is like critical to how we um, how we how we operate and and what we're meant to do, um, and so really encourage y'all to come through um, and show up. So with that, um, I guess I'll pass it to Paige to introduce our guests for today. Wonderful! We are so excited to welcome Greg Jackson as our featured speaker for today. I'm gonna read your bio off, Greg, to give you a moment to get settled, then I'll pass it to you. Um, so Greg is the Equal Justice Works Fellow at the Sustainable Economies Law Center, SCLC. He's a native of Oakland, California with deep family roots, who feels fortunate to live within blocks of his family that now span three generations. He's deeply committed to achieving economic equity in the East Bay through collective ownership and democratic decision-making. Recognizing the many social problems rooted in the unequal distribution of wealth and decision-making power, Greg focused his law school research on international cooperatives. During his internship with the SCLC, he created a pilot program for youth-led cooperative development. As a 2018 Equal Justice Works Legal Fellow, Greg aims to increase collective decision-making and cooperative ownership in East Oakland. He also holds a BA in philosophy from San Diego State University, and a JD from Golden Gate University School of Law. So please welcome to our virtual stage, Greg. Uh, thank you. Um, it's been a it's been a long like two and a half three years. Um, so much so that like I've graduated or moved. I've finished the two year like fellowship program that's on the. Selk website, but haven't updated my title yet. Um, so anyway, um, let's see. I came in uh, ready to talk about community planning and to like kind of speak at it through some different, like uh, I guess phases of my like work experience. Um, so I'll just kind of be talking through that, um, hopefully giving you all some like tips or tricks or gems. Um, feel free to like stop me and ask questions or raise your hand or something. Um, I think we have time at the end. No, we do have time at the end, like five to 10 minutes, but it's always better to have like a conversation instead of a lecture. So uh, whatever works for you all. All right, so um, I guess my, uh, to become an Equal Justice Works Fellow, I needed to uh, lay out a plan for what I would uh, spend uh, 24 months of paid time doing. Um, and at that time, like 2016, 2017, um, I was looking at like, I guess, the awareness and state of cooperative development, cooperative economics in the Bay Area and realizing that like most black folks like didn't really know what co-ops were, didn't really have a desire to learn. And so like that project was focused primarily on like spreading education um, and then like, I guess, creating a job for myself, <laughs> or at least that was the plan at the beginning. Um, and that process was like collaboratively done by uh, working with uh, like other folks at the Law Center before I came in. So Ricardo Nunez and uh, Janelle Orsi were two of my main points of contact. And we, like they allowed for me to, I guess, firstly lay out what I thought like 24 months would look like. 
and then we were able to like come back over the course of like seven editions uh, iterations uh, to creating like the final um, proposal that we sent over to Equal Justice Works, which allowed for me to do this work. Uh, so that was like kind of the first uh, step into um, like this uh, participatory planning, um, at least on a small scale. Um, this pilot project, well, Repaired Nations, which is a fiscally sponsored project of the Sustainable Economies Law Center. Um, right now, we say uh, Repaired Nations is a Pan-African network of support, um, primarily interested in helping folks with technical assistance, uh, financial assistance, and um, education. Um, like historically, we've uh, repaired nations, like especially in like 2017, 2018, when it was first being started, and it was framed more around like a redress for uh, past harms of colonialism, uh, slavery, <laughs> extractive capitalism, etc. Um, and I think like as the work has progressed, we still have that, uh, I guess, uh, background understanding that that's what the work has been doing, but it's also, I guess, flowed into something a little bit different, but pretty much the same as I've like brought the idea to folks who have come on board. Um, we've like had experiences together, worked together and uh, continued to, I guess, make sure that the way we're writing about ourselves is the way that we're actually like coming into the world and doing things. Um, so initially, Repaired Nations was started with a group of nine multi, uh, multi-dimensional <laughs> artists, I, I, um, and so folks who were like uh, like hip hop artists, uh, singers, uh, multimedia artists, um, and other things. And uh, the goal with uh, with this group of people was to gather them, uh, ask for them to support with doing some of the education we were doing. Um, which was uh, Think Outside the Boss workshops, um, which kind of teach the nuts and bolts of how to start a co-op. Uh, it was initially formed or created by the Sustainable Economies Law Center. Um, we were also doing like monthly book clubs where we were teaching folks um, about Collective Courage by Jessica Gordon Imhart and hoping to connect uh, history to practice and invite people to pick up something that um, we didn't know we lost. Um, and so the ways that we approached that like work stream was like essentially first telling them, okay, this is what like we've planned to do so far. It doesn't have to be the way things go. Um, but like, I guess asking, asking them if that was the way that seemed the most, um, most beneficial. Um, and so one of the things that I had I thought would be perfect for this group of like uh, rewriting a skit or the series of skits that went through the Think Outside the Boss workshop that Sustainable Economies Law Center created didn't quite work so well. And I was <laughs> at the beginning I would, I was like, yo, like these artists, they're gonna have so much fun and we're gonna do this. We're gonna like, you know, make all of these skits. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess uh, this is one of the gems that um, I've been picking up from participatory planning is that um, it's it's best to like write it all out or write as much of it out as you can before because it's easier to fail on paper than, uh, or at least cheaper <laughs> to fail on paper than failing like in the real world. Um, but also like being okay with plans adjusting as the context requires. And so um, rather than, I guess, being a super, um, I don't know, the word that comes to mind is like a stick in the mud or being like being not willing to like move and accept where people are. Um, you know, I, I took the pathway of like, okay, um, I'm understanding that this whole like cooperative part is, like taking up more of your like attention brain capacity than I anticipated. And so, you know, we can scale it down and still be successful. Um, and so um, that was a little nugget from the pilot cohort uh, who ended up calling themselves the Kokosi Collective. Uh, we're still working with a lot of these folks. Um, one of them 
um, was a director of uh, Holistic Underground, uh, which is uh, converting into a cooperative from a nonprofit now after a few years of working with us. Um, one of the, or a few of the folks um, came over from a different, uh, were in, well, I met them in a different like music collective, uh, but like a few different collectives have, <clears throat> I guess, formed after folks have learned how to, I guess, uh, facilitate meetings better, uh, have better interpersonal communications and uh, ways of, of talking with each other. So Divine Minds Think Alike uh, was formed uh, from one of the ladies who was part of this uh, initial Kokosi Collective. Uh, the NEX Means, <clears throat> the NEX Means Collective, uh, which was like doing open mics beforehand, um, like, I guess deepened in their uh, practice of cooperative and collective work has since uh, like uh, incorporated an LLC and are starting to like, I guess, get a better handle on their business and how they work together. Um, the other things that I wanna talk about, I thought I'd be able to go through things through these things quickly. Um, I wanted to talk to you all about uh, the Equal Justice Works Fellowship, the Kokosi Collective, which was the pilot cohort, um, my experience on the EB Prec staff, uh, the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative, uh, my experience helping to launch a different but similar uh, real estate cooperative, which is which we call Wakanda or Okanda. Um, ex and uh, experiences like starting a media committee uh, within Repaired Nations, uh, newly formed this year. Um, and so I speak to you about the Equal Justice Works Fellowship and about the Kokosi Collective Pilot Cohort. Uh, the, the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative, um, I joined in about 2017, 2018 as a contractor and eventually became um, uh, one of the staff owners for some time. Um, the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative uh, is focused on uh, really trying to um, stop gentrification, uh, stop the like extractive um, exploitation that's coming through the real estate market, uh, keep people housed in their homes and doing it at uh, at like affordable rates, um, and also opening it opening up investment to the community so that. Um, the high cost of capital, um, like debt or investment, uh, could be brought down uh, through community investment. And uh, EB Prec was uh, really, um, I mean, really formative for me. Um, so the way that, um, like, I experienced the co-op was when I first started coming in, uh, they had just finished what were called advisory council sessions where they were asking uh, people like within the like solidarity economy network here in the Bay Area, like what are the things that um, like, a, like a cooperative seeking to like end displacement, uh, what are the things that that cooperative should be forefronting? How should it be structured? Um, and there was maybe like up to a year of, of uh, data and feedback that the staff collective um, when I joined was tasked with um, synthesizing and uh, creating a set of bylaws for the organization to then continue moving forward. Um, as the uh, staff were, was doing this process of like creating the bylaws, uh, we were also making sure to have like monthly check-in sessions with uh, community members who were signing up or who had said that they'd like to sign up uh, to ensure that uh, the, things were the, the things we created were the things they were asking for. Um, and uh, just to like make sure that we were navigating this thing right um, early on. Um, we, uh, the the co-op has been able to have, uh, I think a great deal of success and uh, there's more to come. Um, in 2019, just before uh, the pandemic, uh, we were doing this, uh, what we called a Black, Ec Black Economic Salon Sessions, uh, where we gathered, um, at its height, about 60 people um, who were then split into different subgroups um, with the task of figuring out how can we revitalize one of the cultural corridors that um, you know, were thriving in Black history um, in recent times, but because of like the BART station, the freeway, eminent domain, uh, those places were displaced and are, long, are, and are no longer here. 
Um, and so uh, the Black Economic Salon um, really started with thinking about, okay, how do we leverage the, um, I guess the work that Mandela Grocery Cooperative has been doing um, in terms of like setting the stage, setting the culture, getting folks uh, familiar with cooperatives, trusting cooperatives. How do we build on that to create a cooperative corridor and connected with, uh, in a, I guess, uh, it's not abandoned, but uh, essentially abandoned property um, on the end of the corridor before the freeway called Esther's Orbit Room, uh, which was a jazz club in the early uh, 90s and 20s, 1990s, or 1920s and 30s. Um, and uh, I guess suffered um, massively after the BART train and the, and the freeway. Um, and so now EB Preck is in contract with uh, the owners of that property. Um, seeking to transition it back into community hands. Um, they've done a, uh, a DPO, which um, I think is at 12 or 14 states nationwide, um, instead of just California residents that can, uh, that can invest. Um, and really um, the participatory planning that came into effect in this Black Economic Salon was like people really telling us what they wanted for like a cultural hub to be. Um, building it out with us and um, the, really the goal for that specific uh, session was to pitch a black developer who is uh, renovating the BART station, the local transit, uh, to include this project so that uh, the voice of the community um, and cooperatives could be like, uh, could receive its fair due based on you know, uh, the amount of support and requests that it's getting. Unfortunately, uh, that like proposal didn't happen how uh, we thought it would, but it did uh, kind of lead us on this path or lead EB Prec on the path of uh, purchasing Esther's Orbit Room or at least getting into contract and being prepared to purchase it and uh, you know, revitalize the 7th Street corridor. Um, since that time, I've uh, like transitioned over into a governance director, um, which is what we call the president at EB Prec. And uh, yeah, the staff has grown from like a five person collective to an eight person collective, which is going to have more folks on. So that's been really exciting. And I think one of the participatory planning challenges like within the co-op and its staff is figuring out like what is the best electronic <laughs> way to, to do planning with each other, All right, especially in uh, like the pandemic years. Um, Pre-pandemic, we were able to like get big butcher papers, like figure out what the different um, like topics or like high level uh, like vision statements are, and then build uh, you know build that out together. Um, but <laughs> uh, you know, with the shelter in place orders and um, you know not really being able to come to the office, um, we were able to. I guess, deep in a practice that we had I just started before the pandemic, uh, which was uh, like formulating a spreadsheet um, so that it took note of the top, uh, uh, I guess, work streams that we were going to engage in. And then also have uh, sections for us to say what's gonna happen for each quarter in each of those work streams. Um, and the way that uh, the staff went about that was uh, we delegated or you know voluntold uh, some folks to to do it initially, um, usually in teams of like two to three, before bringing that um, their work back to the larger staff, where we would compare that with what other work streams were um, suggesting, and uh, doing like an integration process, talking about like okay, like this law sounds great, but do we have capacity? <laughs> Uh, does this need to happen here? Or can it happen there, um, et cetera? Um, and then uh, after, yeah, after like doing that process for all of the different work streams, uh, the staff is able to, you know, find consensus or consent um, on the whole picture, and then move forward uh, for you know the quarter or quarters, depending on how many uh, you've done up front. Um, and I think that's been helpful, and it it's uh, one of the things I've learned. Um, by doing that kind of process in EB Prec is that um, it's really great to, to you know, plan with, with others and, and do that up front. Um, but if, uh, if there isn't a practice about 
like returning to what was created and checking in to see if it if we hit those markers or if we need to like adjust a little bit. Um, if we don't like kind of do that regular check-in, then it almost is like we didn't do that planning <laughs> because we're gonna, uh, we often forget, or at least I would forget um, like what it is we were doing. Uh, thankfully, oftentimes um, like we already knew what we were gonna do and we just kind of like do it instinctually. Um, but there are times when you know, it, it's really important to have that practice of, of returning back, seeing what we projected, um, determining if our projections were accurate, um, and then, you know, going through the whole process again. Um, <laughs> so the, the next, uh, like, work, the next thing that I'll be talking about um, is the uh, Pan-African Solidarity Economy Network conferences uh, that I've been a part of. Um, and helped to launch in 2019 during the year of return in Ghana. Um, and so uh, I guess for a little bit of context, um, like Ghana and the you know Western uh, portion of like, uh, I guess that the Bay of Benin is I think what it's called. A lot of um, the ancestors of, uh, you know, a lot of our enslaved ancestors like came from that region. I mean, and so it's very important um, for black people in my opinion uh, to uh, like return back uh, close some of those like ancestral harms challenges like desires um and yeah uh, i think that's as best as i can explain it uh it, it's a very like i guess spiritual experience um but also what um there's like an economic um, component. Um, the Africa recently uh, like created, um, darn, what is it called? Uh, they recently created a trade block where pretty much 50, like almost all 54 countries um, have said like, yes, we're going to create the African Union, which has a borderless trade. And it's going to, it's projected to create a lot of boom um, in terms of an economy that's already been booming in Africa, has one of like most of like the fastest growing economies are already in Africa. Um, and so we were, I guess, excited about going back, but also realizing that there was a moment for capital interest to like stream in to Ghana and like lay a foundation for extractive capitalism, something like we don't want and would hope that uh, like collective effort can uh, save the world from. And so our goal was to like go to Ghana, start creating or start building relationships and talking about like what Pan-African solidarity can look like um, and how like people in the US and people in Ghana can come together and create something, uh, something lovely. Um, initially in 2019, uh, when it was just like an idea in my head that I was trying to get people to uh, like join in on, um, I. I was still learning how to like uh, put things on paper so that folks can understand what it is they're walking into. Um, and so like, I, I'm always trying to do that now, uh, but essentially I had to um, like coordinate that, uh, that first conference uh, primarily with myself with the help of one other like part-time paid person and volunteers that could support when they, when they could. Um, after the conference, um, everyone was super excited um, very much wanting to like deepen their cooperative practice. Um, and so the next year, uh, 2020, it's the pandemic, but now uh, four people are willing to like help um, coordinate with me uh, throughout the whole year. And we were able to do some pretty um, ambitious things. <laughs> we, uh, we, named, uh, we named a whole week Black Cooperatives Week. <laughs> and uh, had some uh, programming around that in addition to the conference, uh, which um, like highlighted uh, folks from Ghana, um, the US, and also had like attendees from Sudan and Cameroon. And it, it, was, it was wonderful. Um, and uh, I guess that leads into now, 2021, where uh, there's a group of six people who are uh, leading the conference without much uh, input from me. 
which feels fantastic. And I just kind of have to like come in and support with some of the like long distance, long-term planning. Um, and that process has primarily looked like uh, creating a timeline on a spreadsheet and saying like, okay, uh, for the month of, let's say June, uh, we know that we're gonna be doing uh, like Pan-African uh, work group stuff. Uh, the, the committee is gonna be doing like, I guess leadership committee related things, education committee related things. And uh, I'm blanking on the rest of them. But anyway, so like we, we talk about the different work groups or at least like know that there are these different work groups. And at the beginning of the month, we uh, project out what we're gonna be doing for that month to get towards our larger goal. Um, and that larger goal being like hosting the conference. This year, it's gonna be October 1st through the 3rd. And so, um, yeah, they've asked me to like come in and just kind of do something at the top of every month to help um, remind uh, them of the work that they have done and to help set the stage for, uh, for what's moving forward. Um, something that I forgot to mention about uh, the conference is that in 2019, the, the initial year, um, we also took half a day of the conference to gather the folks that came from uh, you know, the different parts of Ghana, even like the Ivory Coast um, and, and the US. And we, how do I say, we uh, voted on what the top three things that we needed to like discuss in terms of creating a Pan-African solidarity economy network. Um, those were um, communications, uh, short-term projects and long-term projects. Um, we then split everyone who was at the conference into groups, one of those three groups. Um, one, and we uh, nominated or had someone nominate themselves to be the facilitator. Um, and so we all kind of split up and talked about like, what are the top three things that we need to do in order to launch this network? Um, I was in the communications group and uh, part of that was um, like creating uh, profiles or creating a website where people could have profiles and they could like say what it is they're doing and uh, have a place to like network with each other. Uh, there was a request for like, um, like ongoing education. Um, and I forget the last one. I think there were two are kind of the same thing. Um, for the short term projects, there were uh, talks about um, like creating um, a shipping cooperative so that um, products in Ghana can come to the US. Um, <laughs> I think we were also all really like loving this drink in Ghana called pokeke, uh, which is like fermented ginger. And we were like, we got to bring this back. This is going to be part of the shipping co-op. Um, and then, then uh, the long-term plans, uh, which were more of like doing a, uh, a real estate development in Ghana, um, helping to talk through some of the, like, uh, I guess, how do I say? Helping like the African-Americans and the African uh, folks like talk through slavery, oppression and like <laughs> what that feels like, looks like from different sides of the pond because like there are different assumptions and things that come with that. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was like 2019, um, you know, in Ghana. Um, I feel like I've just talked a whole bunch and I hope it's been helpful. Um, there's still a few things that I can like touch on, but yeah, I'm curious. Like Gregory actually like considering we only have four minutes, I was like, ah, might as well just create some space for folks to ask some questions. Is that cool? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Um, any thoughts, questions, reactions even? Um, there's a lot that Gregory shared. Um, some like, I don't know, I'm just, it sounds really, really cool. Um, I know Sierra had asked before, I guess maybe the correspondence, was that virtual, um, the work that you were doing? Um, which, which, yeah, which question were you talking about, which was a virtual, Sierra? Um, yeah, I did have a question. So the work that you were doing in Ghana, um, particularly, uh, I was wondering if that was virtual or if there's any plans to have um, virtual conferences. That was the first question. 
Um, it started in Accra, Ghana. We were able to fly over. Um, last year, it was virtual. Um, and this year, it'll likely be a hybrid, but we won't be going to Africa. We'll be going to Mississippi. And um, I guess highlighting the like <laughs> the connections between the motherland and Mississippi, the Nile, the you know the river, Mississippi River, the mounds, the pyramids, etc. Oh, that sounds really dope. Um, and then my second question was um, maybe if you could like synthesize like your top three tips because uh, I heard tips throughout, but if you could synthesize like your top three tips for particip participatory planning um, and budgeting and all that stuff. Yeah, um, I guess the first tip is be transparent and compassionate <laughs> when doing the planning. Uh, transparent and like, you know, if, if one has an idea or a vision, just say it and let people like say if it's good or bad, as opposed to like trying to hide the ball and then manipulate people to get there. Um, compassionate in that, you know, um, <laughs> we have to be compassionate for ourselves. Um, you know, we might think it's a really good idea, but if our groups, if our group doesn't, you know, and then I think it's both ways. Um, another uh, tip is um, to create a plan and then come back to it at like a predefined intervals. And so it could be like weekly, monthly, quarterly, whatever it is, but just making sure that, um, the things we create don't just become <laughs> like, uh, I don't know, uh, I'm thinking like megabytes in our Google Drive, <laughs> just like, you know, things we've created, we don't, we don't return back. Um, let's see, let's see a third one. A third one, I believe, I believe a third one, and I, I may not have mentioned this, but I'm glad I'm able to know. Um, it's important to like say up front like what the process is for um, implementing whatever the planning is, or like what the process is for approving a plan for implementation, I should say. Um, and so um, whether it's like majority rules, uh, super majority, consensus, consent, maybe one person just gets to say, <laughs> whatever it is, like make sure folks like know it and, and are aware of it because that can like lead to tension by there being like uncertainty around around that piece. Um, and so those are their, like the top three ones, I guess I'll say. Um, yeah, we're at time, but I want to ask you about the process part. Mm -hmm. um, because with like co-ops or participatory type planning, uh, there's gonna be like some like power imbalance, like in a co-op, maybe there's some people who are like worker owners or people who are like on track or maybe not um, even. Uh, so like even setting the process, there might be power imbalances. I was just wondering if you had like experience with certain types of processes that like works better than others. Yeah, yeah, thank you for saying that. And that's totally a thing that like we have to be careful of when being in co-ops. Uh, the Law Center, EB Prec and Repaired Nations um, use like a consensus based decision-making process. Um, what's the, uh, sorry, there's a word for this. Um, all, all sociocratic, like kind of like sociocracy. Um, and so what that means is like every time there's a proposal, um, there's always a, a round of just questions where everyone gets to ask their clarifying questions. There's always, I mean, and there could be multiple rounds. Uh, there's always a round of feedback uh, so people like everyone gets a chance, even if you just want to pass to say like, you know, to offer their feedback into the room. Um, and then, um, yeah, there's like a vote after that, or maybe there's a request to like, you know, integrate some feedback before bringing it to a vote because folks aren't, aren't quite um, comfortable with it. Um, so that process has been helpful in, in the sense of like giving space for everyone to talk. But the other side of it, and I guess like, you know, things have, things are dual sided. The other side is that um, it just takes a long time. And so if it's a group of 20 people and everyone has something to say, it could take forever. And you might not even get to the agenda item. You'll check in and then it'll be time to check out. <laughs> um, and so um, there's probably a need. 
none of the places I've I work in or use this like process with have put like time limits on all the time, but sometimes that helps just so everyone knows like we have 30 seconds, 60 seconds to talk. It's and uh, yeah, <laughs> sometimes it's fun being the person who gets to chop people off. It's like we told you. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's like being back in Model UN. Yeah, um, thank you so much. This has been really great. Um, I really appreciate uh, your last tip about um, decision making. Um, and maybe, I don't know, it just sort of made me think of just like how to operationalize that. Um, within our work uh, even. Um, I definitely think even the round of like questions, I love that that's like, we kind of do something like that, but um, so super, super appreciate you, Gregory. Thank you so much. Claps all around, claps all around. <laughs> um, and um, we are transitioning um, to our member teams uh, I made a mistake earlier, actually. Oh, and we can also stop uh, the recording. <laughs> Bye. Which I guess I have to do. <laughs>